Uh, good evening and welcome to tonight's lecture. Um, this lecture is funded is part of the National Affairs Series with funding from the Government of the Student Body. Um, I'd like to announce a few upcoming lectures before we start tonight. Um, on January 25th at 8 p.m. in the Sunroom um, is the Affirmative Action and Other Strategies to End Discrimination and Racism. Um, on January 31st, there's a lecture entitled Toward a Unified Theory of Black America. And then there's a couple more here. Setting America on a New Course by Tom Daschle, and I believe that will be uh, televised. And there's also, that's on February 1st. And then on February 2nd, Why Intelligent Design is Not Science. And I believe that will be televised as well. Um, at the conclusion of the lecture tonight, um, there'll be a reception and a book signing. Um, but right now, I'd like to bring up a professor of journalism, longtime friend of tonight's speaker, uh, Barbara Mack. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Barbara Mack, and I'm a professor in the Greenlee School of Journalism and Communication. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you tonight a man I have known for more than 30 years. I've known him so long he remembers me skinny. <laughs> Michael is a man from whom I have been privileged to learn. Now, the easy introduction would just be to give you a praises of his, praise of his resume and a summary of the awards and the honors that have been bestowed on him. But you can read that, I hope. Uh, you all received the flyer. And by the way, you should know you're participating in the first podcasted lecture at Iowa State University. Isn't that terrific and absolutely appropriate? Michael is indeed much honored and appropriately so. He's been the editorial voice of several well-respected newspapers, including the Des Moines Register and of the National Broadcasting Company. He was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for the editorials he wrote as the editor and co-owner of the Ames Tribune and probably one of my favorites, he runs a great baseball team that makes summers in Des Moines so much fun. If you haven't come down to see the Iowa Cubs, come. Absolutely. But let me give you the inside information, at least as I know it. First, you should probably know that Michael is the second most talented journalist in his family. His parents, Carl and Marge Gartner, were wonderful people, and Carl was an editor at the Register when I started as a copy girl in 1969. He was a superb editor and a lovely human being, and he'd also race me up the stairway from the third floor composing room to the fourth floor newsroom, and he would usually win. I was 17. He was in his 60s. When Michael was awarded the Pulitzer Prize, Carl absolutely glowed. I taught him how to dangle his first participle, he said. <laughs> Nothing could have pleased Michael more than his father's pure, unabated joy. Michael followed his father and started working in the Register newsroom at the sports desk on Friday nights. He loved newspapering. He was born to it. And after he graduated from Carleton College, it didn't take long before he found himself in New York and found himself the front page editor of the Wall Street Journal. While he was at the Journal, he fell in love with his beautiful, beautiful wife, Barbara McCoy. Barbara, good name and challenged the company's policy that said when employees fell in love, one of them, and it was implied that it was the woman, would leave her job. Barbara and Michael challenged the policy, and Barbara and Michael both kept their jobs. But Iowa had kept a really close hold on him, and when the Register needed a clear-headed, decisive editor with real vision about what the paper could do, he came back to the town he grew up in. His devotion to his hometown and to local journalism is one of the things that I truly love about him, along with his devotion to the English language. He believes in civic journalism in the very best sense of the word. Journalists should tell the truth. Journalists should watch public officials. Journalists should be watchdogs of the public interest. And on the editorial pages, 
journalists should be clear-headed advocates for their readers and for their communities. In his new book, he documents exactly how newspaper editorials have done that, how they have advocated for the common good of the community and the common good of the nation. He examines how the editorial pages of a newspaper can force a community to look at the poor or the disenfranchised or the targets of discrimination. Those editorials and the people who write them deserve both our thanks and our respect. And so does the wonderful man who writes about them with honesty and with eloquence. I'm delighted he's here with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Gardner. First of all, I want to know what this meant by when he said funding for tonight's lecture. <laughs> Nobody has offered me a nickel. And so, I don't know what that meant. Second of all, I'm in trouble now. Barbara said I'm the second best journalist in my family, and I suspect she was talking about my father. So I have to go home, and my wife, who is an editor at the Wall Street Journal, is going to say how to go, and I was going to say, Barbara doesn't think, uh, Barbara Mack doesn't think you're a very good journalist. <laughs> and then I'm going to have a real problem. Reminds me, Bill Reichart was a friend of mine and Randy Duncan, and one night they were at a dinner party with their wives, and it was going around the room, and, and it got to everybody, and it got to Duncan, and said, it was, who's your best friend? And they get to Duncan, and Duncan says, Reichart's my best friend. Obviously, Reichart's my best friend. We've known each other forever. Get to Reichart and says, who's your best friend? And Reichart says, well, Sue, my wife, is my best friend. Reichardt says at four in the morning, the phone rings, says Duncan. He says, God damn it, he says, I've been up all night trying to explain to Paula that she's really my best friend. <laughs> so I'm going to have to be up all night explaining to my wife that uh, she really is the best journalist in the, uh, in the family, and she, and she is. Um, you saw Barbara give me a hug up here. I should tell you, she mentioned my father. My, my father uh, worked at the newspaper until he was 70, 70 years old, I guess. And uh, one time, Barbara went up to him, and she was a copy girl, probably 18 or 19 years old, and she said, Mr. Gartner, how long have you worked at this newspaper? He was a short man, shorter than I am. She was a big girl. And he said, why, Barbara, I've worked here for 40 years. And she said, Mr. Gartner, in those 40 years, has anybody in this newsroom ever just picked you up and given you a great big hug and a kiss? And he said, well, no, Barbara, nobody in 40 years ever has. And she says, let me be the first. And she picked him up and gave him a great big hug and kiss right in the middle of the newsroom, uh, which he remembered until the day he died, which was a long time. He didn't die till last year at age 102. Uh, another time, he ran into her somewhere. You know, when she was a copy girl, she was always wearing jeans and everything. And, he came home one day and he says, you know that Barbara Mack? He says, she cleans up pretty well. I don't know where he'd seen her, but uh, anyway, you clean up pretty well, Barbara. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, letting me come up here to talk about uh, editorials and um, about, this, uh, about this book, which Barbara neglected to mention the name of. It's, uh, it's called uh, Outrage, Passion, and Uncommon Sense. Uh, and it came about because I'm on the board of a thing called the Museum in Washington, which is a great museum of news. They're building a big new one in uh, downtown Washington next uh, across the street from the National Gallery. And they asked me if I could prepare a gallery on uh, editorials. And I said, sure, it'd be fun. So we're doing it, and the chief executive said, this would really make a book. Would you be interested in doing a book? And I said, no, I don't want to deal with agents. I don't want to deal with publishers. And he said, we'll do all that. So I said, sure. So I just had a, I had a wonderful time. And the, uh, my worst problem was that uh, I didn't want to stop reporting and start writing, but um, I didn't know how to organize it. And ultimately, I organized it into eight subjects, uh, death, race, politics, and things like that. And let me start by reading you a, a couple of the, uh, death was my favorite, uh, uh, was, my, was my favorite category because it was just so wonderful. And, l and let me read you uh, uh, the beginning of an editorial uh, 
called The Beast is Dead. The, uh, there was a Civil War general named Ben Butler, those of you who are historians would, would know of him, um, and uh, he, he wasn't a very good general. And after the war, he was assigned in Reconstruction to New Orleans, and he was just a terrible person. He was a dictator, and he treated women terribly and blacks terribly and everything, and, and the people just despised him. And he also stole silverware. He was known as Spoons. Uh, but uh, uh, when, he, when he finally died on Jan in uh, January of 1893, the Nashville Daily American wrote an editorial about his death. I'll just read you a couple of paragraphs of it. The headline is, The Beast is Dead. Old Ben Butler is dead. Early yesterday morning, the angel of death, acting under the devil's orders, took him from earth and landed him in hell. In all this southern country, there are no tears, no sighs, and no regrets. He lived only too long. We are glad he has at last been removed from earth, and even pity the devil, the possession he has secured. <laughs> then it gets nasty. <laughs> says... He was a truckling demagogue whose selfishness amounted to pollution. He was an autocrat who used power to wreak personal revenge. He was mean and malignant, a hangman from prejudice, the insulter of women, a braggadocio, a trickster, and a scoundrel whose heart was as black as the smoke from the coals that are now scorching his soul. They don't write him like that anymore. Although... Uh, a guy named Richard Argood came close in 1975. He, he um, uh, wrote for the uh, Philadelphia Daily News, a tabloid newspaper, and then later for the, for the Newark News. And he was a wonderful, wonderful uh, writer. I once said to him, I, when I was at Ames, I wrote long, long editorials. And, and I once said to him, I said, Richard, anything you can say in, in, uh, in 47 words, I can say in 900. But, but uh, uh, there was a um, murderer and, and, uh, who had been convicted and... Um, Argood wrote this editorial. The headline is called, Yes, the Chair. I'll read it to you in its entirety. It says, It's about time for Leonard Edwards to take the hot squat. Edwards, for those of you who haven't been following his worthless career, has been convicted of two murders. He's awaiting trial on another murder and the rape of a 14-year-old girl. He's 29 years old. Hopes of rehabilitating this piece of human crud are doubtful. It's even wildly optimistic to use the word doubtful. The last time Edwards was freed, it was on bail pending appeal of an overly generous third-degree murder conviction. He had just stabbed somebody to death, and justice, in all its majesty, had found him guilty. Edwards then went out and killed somebody else. His second murder jury was right. He's not worth the upkeep. Fry him. <laughs> he always knew where guys like Richard Argood stood, which is one of the hallmarks um, uh, of... Uh, the good editorial, you know, and on the news side, fair, balance, uh, all those things that Fox says that it isn't, uh, uh, newspapers are supposed to be. And, and, and uh, in the course of writing this book, uh, I took it upon myself to become judge and jury to pick the best editorial writers ever. And I chose four, four people from four different generations. They were Horace Greeley of the uh, New York Tribune, and he invented the, the editorial page. You know, somebody had to, and he did in the 1850s. He was the first person who, who separated uh, editorial content from news and put it on a separate paper. And he, was, and he wrote great stuff. He probably wrote the most important editorial ever written in the history of America, which was not, yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus, and, and which I'll tell you about in a minute. The other person, next person I picked, was a man named Henry Watterson who for 50 years was the uh, editor of the Courier-Journal in Louisville from 1868 to 1918. And if you ever see a picture of Lincoln taking the oath at his first inaugural, the young reporter standing next to him, and that shows you, tells you one thing, young reporters can't stand next to, old reporters can't stand next to a president nowadays, but right there on the platform there was a young reporter, and it was a young Henry Watterson working for the Associated Press. But he was a terrific editorial writer, and the older he got, the better the better he got, so there's hope. And and the third third man I picked was uh, a man named William Allen White. Uh, William Allen White owned a little newspaper in Emporia, Kansas called the Gazette. And for about 50 years, he wrote editorials there and he became, he became world famous. Uh, uh, William McKinley was elected president because of an editorial that, uh, that uh, William Allen White wrote called What's the Matter with Kansas? And it was uh, <clears throat> a very uh, Republican, conservative editorial. And uh, McKinley's uh, campaign manager, uh, What's his name? Um, <clears throat> picked it up and uh, and 
reprinted millions of copies of it and spread it around the country and, and acknowledged that that was what elected, uh, what elected McKinley. Uh, William Allen White uh, was a feisty guy and, and a lot of people in town didn't like his editorials or didn't like him. And so uh, in the early years of the, uh, the 20th century, in about 1904, 1905, he bought a big billboard and put it up in Emporia, mm -hmm. in Emporia, Kansas. It says, all right, it says, cuss the Gazette, but read it. I always thought that was a great motto, you know, for a, for a newspaper, second only to the one out in Aspen, Colorado, the Aspen Times, which is, if you don't want it in the newspaper, don't do it. Uh, uh, or, or maybe the, the guy in uh, uh, suburban Chicago, I can't remember his name, had an editorial, a, a motto on the editorial page every day. It says, our motto, it says, tell the truth, fear God, make money. And uh, I once said to him, is it always in that order? He says, no, toward the end of the month we put make money first. But, uh, 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 but William Allen White was the third, a wonderful, wonderful, great, uh, great editorial writer. And the fourth was a man named Vermont, Connecticut Royster, who was the uh, editor of the Wall Street Journal and uh, uh, wrote the, uh, the major editorials in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s. And his real name was Vermont, Connecticut Royster. Uh, and I knew him, because I, I used to work at the Journal, as Barbara said, and one time I said to him, I said, what about the name? And like, he said, what name? I said, oh yeah, you know. Uh, uh, and I said, how did it happen? And he said, well, he said, my mother loved my father-in-law so much, her father-in-law so much, that she named me after him, and his name was Vermont Connecticut Royster. And I said, well, how did he get the name then? And, and, and he said, well, his father and his family named all the children after states. And in fact, I used to hear Royster talk lovingly about Uncle Wiss, uh, who was uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, and there was Iowa, there was Iowa Indiana, and, and, and things like that. And, and uh, I said, well, what happened? You know, why, did, why, why didn't it carry on? He said, well, I had another great uncle who named one of his sons Con Nathaniel Confederate States Royster. And he says he took in the whole damn South and it made everybody else so mad they quit doing it. And I thought that was just, you know, Royster, a Royster story. But when he died, I wrote a piece about him in USA Today. And I got a letter from a lady. He says, my grandfather was Nathaniel Confederate States Royster. And that's a true story. And so, so his, uh, his name was Vermont uh, Connecticut Royster. And he also was great. And the, and the thing, the, the, the qualities that brought them together is they were all, the four of those, they were great reporters. They wrote with with uh, 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 with elegance, and they were eloquent, and they they were very persuasive. They were very persuasive. So they could. Uh, I, w I once said to Royster when he said to me actually uh, when I was coming out to Des Moines, he called me up, and he says, "You going out there to Iowa?" And I said, "Yes, Roy, I am." And he says. You gonna be writing editorials? And I says, yes, I, where I am. He says, you better come see me. So I said, okay. And so I went downstairs to see him. And he says, have you ever written an editorial? And I says, no, sir, I haven't. He says, do you know how to write an editorial? And I says, no. I says, but I expect you're about to tell me. And he says, yes. He says, it's simple. And I says, what's that? And he says, give the other side the space and give your side the thought. And, and I always thought that was just a great rule, you know, just a spectacular rule. In other words, be fair. But be persuasive and use the facts the best way you know how, like a lawyer does in a in a brief. And and I, I always thought that was just wonderful, wonderful, uh, wonderful advice. Uh, Ro Royster, I, I, I want to uh, read you an editorial uh, here that Royster didn't write, but his deputy did. But it was Royster's influence and everything. And I just want to read you a couple of pieces of it, and to show you that if you would just change one or two words, it could. You could write this editorial today. It was called The Logic of the Battlefield, and it was in 1968, in the middle of the Vietnam War. It says, we think the American people, this was in the Wall Street Journal, you have to remember that too, the Wall Street Journal, a very conservative newspaper. We think the American people should be getting ready to accept, if they haven't already, the prospect that the whole Vietnam effort may be doomed. It may be falling apart beneath our feet. The actual military situation may be making academic the philosophical arguments for the intervention in the first place. I mean, just, you know, change one word in that, and a lot of newspapers would run that today. And then it goes on. It's talking about President Johnson. It, it, and it says, it seems in, increasingly doubtful that the original purposes can, longer be, can any longer be achieved. The logic of the battlefield suggests that the U.S. could get forced out of an untenable position. We don't know that the possibility is being squarely faced in Washington. It seems rather unlikely. 
The administration insists that the communist drives are failing of their aims, which Senator Fulbright describes as, quote, wholly irrational, a fantastic analysis. President Johnson seems more firmly committed to Vietnam than ever. Now, stubbornness up to a point is a virtue, but stubbornness can also go beyond the realm of reasonableness. We believe the administration is duty-bound to recognize that no battle and no more is worth any price, no matter how ruinous, and that in the case of Vietnam, it may be failing for the simple reason that the whole place and cause is collapsing from within. I mean, think how eloquent that is. Think how brave it was to write that, for the Wall Street Journal of all papers to write that in the middle of this war and how unpopular it was. But they believed it, they studied it, they believed it, and they had the courage to do it. And, and, and that changed a lot of minds. That was sort of the beginning of the change. That and CBS, Walter Cronkite, bringing it into the living rooms every night. So uh, editorial, editorials can be enormously powerful, enormously powerful uh, uh, when, they're, when they're well thought out, when they're, when they're, when they're well reasoned, and, and, when they're, and when they're well written. I want to read you another one that could be written today. And this one was written, this was by Horace Greeley. And it was written um, in 1851. It's just, it's, this is just a piece of it. He, he wrote it long and long and long. But, but uh, um, in 1851, the major issue in New York City and in much of the nation was the teaching of religion in public schools, if you can believe it. I mean, you know, some things never change. Some things never change. And it involved, it involved the Catholic Archbishop, a guy named Archbishop Hughes, who wanted religion taught in the public schools. Ultimately, he lost, and that led to the beginning of the, of the Catholic school system in America. But the fight was raging. The fight was raging in, 18, in 1851. And Greeley uh, wrote an editorial, and this is an excerpt of it. It's sort of addressed to the bishop. It says, that we differ with the bishop on certain points of religious faith is quite true, but we have no wish to abridge his liberty on that account. We hold his right to civil and religious freedom as precious as our own. He would have religion form a part of every child's education. Very good. We concur in that view. But it is one thing to assume that each child should be taught religion, and quite another to maintain that religious dogmas should be taught in common schools. We desire and intend that our own children shall be taught religion. We do not desire that it shall be taught them in common schools. For this, we shall take them to church, to Sunday school, to Bible class, or wherever else they may be taught by those who we believe will teach them divine truth in its purity. While for the acquisition of reading, writing, arithmetic, etc., we shall send them to common or secular schools. Why is not this distinction a natural and, justice, and, and just one? How can a man as wise as the archbishop speak of our common school system as, quote, not calculated to meet the requirements which Catholic parents, at least, are bound to fulfill toward their Catholic offspring? Why, reverend sir, it never pretended to do any such thing. You might as well object that it does not wash, dress, and vaccinate them. Why should you find fault with the schools for doing their own proper work and not attempting yours? I mean, what a wonderful editorial. You know, in 1851, you know, 150 years ago. Uh, and the same, you could write the same thing today, the same exact thing today uh, in, a lot, in a lot of school districts. Uh, now, um, one thing I learned in, uh, in writing this book was that Walt Whitman was an editorial writer. I never, I never knew that until I got into this. And he was an editorial writer, mainly uh, for, for a very short time, a couple of years, for a newspaper called Aurora in, uh, in New York City, which I had never heard of either. Uh, but I found some editorials he wrote, and uh, even earlier than 1851, he was on this same subject. He was not as rational and logical as Greeley was. He was more of a, he was more of a hothead. And on this same issue, uh, at one point, uh, various times, he referred to Archbishop Hughes as a hypocritical scoundrel, that reverend villain, and a man with corrupt and selfish motives. Once a critic assailed uh, Whitman for editorial showing, quote, the fiercest invective and the hottest hate, he replied in print that we are well aware that we use strong language. We meant to. Uh, after an election in which the uh, Catholic schools were the issue, rioters attacked the bishop's house. And uh, the next day, Whitman wrote in, a, in an editorial, in the course of the evening, some of the windows of the priest Hughes' residence were broken by brickbats. 
Had it been the reverend hypocrite's head instead of his windows, we could hardly find it in our soul to be sorrowful. I mean, you know, unbelie- unbelievable stuff. Uh, uh, but uh, it was really, editorial writers really spoke their mind in those days, and they don't so much today. And there's probably lots of reasons. One is, uh, one thing that these four had in common was Greeley owned his own newspaper, White owned his own newspaper, Watterson had an ownership in the Courier Journal, and Royster ran a newspaper that was owned by a very benevolent family that let him think that let him, uh, that, that let him think he was the owner. Uh, 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 so um, they had this uh, this great uh, sense of uh, community, sense of doing right by the community, and also uh, of fearlessness. Uh, uh, they really, they just really wanted to say what they thought and and to tell the truth. And and these days, so many papers are owned by chains, and uh, so many uh, editors, editorial pages, editor, editors are itinerant. They don't understand their community. They don't develop an affection for it or a love for it. You can't write about a community unless you really, really love it. Unless you have a great affection for it. You're not supposed to be a a civic booster, but you're not supposed to be a common scold either. You're supposed to tell the people what's going on and, and report and and uh, and argue forcefully for what you think is right. And you're supposed to have fun. You're supposed to have fun as well. Uh, if I can, uh, uh, well, uh, let me. Uh, speaking of chain newspapers, let me write you. Uh, let me read you one other uh, editorial on death. One of the first chain newspapers was a man named Frank Munsey. Frank Munsey. Uh, in the early 1900s, owned a bunch of newspapers and magazines, and he was disdained by uh, most in the profession, including William Allen White. And when uh, Munsey died, White wrote a very short editorial called Rest in Trust. said, Frank Munsey, the great publisher, is dead. Frank Munsey contributed to the journalism of his day the talent of a meatpacker, the morals of a money changer, and the manners of an undertaker. He and his kind have about succeeded in transforming a once noble profession into an 8% security. May he rest in trust. The only difference you'd make today is you'd say a 30% security instead of an 8% security, but it would, this would go for uh, some, of the, some of my friends in the, in the, profession, in the profession as well. The, the newspaper editorial often leads, uh, and uh, I want to give you a couple examples examples of it, and then uh, we can ask questions. Pat, how long am I supposed to do this, wherever Pat is? Pat? Well, I have to spend a lot, take, take extra time when I get home to explain to my wife why she's not a good journalist, so. Uh, <laughs> but let me read a few more, and then I'll be happy to answer, answer any, uh, any questions, if that's, if that's okay. Um, the most, the greatest editorial not great. It's the most important editorial uh, ever written. I'm stalling to find it here. Um, was called uh, the Prayer of Twenty Million, and it was written during the Civil War. Um, as a letter. Oh, before I read it, I should. I meant to start by reading this one. The worst case in the history of the Supreme Court to date uh, (laughs) certainly would be the Dred Scott decision. And in 1857, when the decision was handed down, the Albany, New York newspaper wrote this editorial. Now listen to this. If it was set ragged right, it would be a poem. I'll just read you. It's not a very long editorial, but I just want to read you a couple pieces of it. It says, unworthy of the bench from which it was delivered, unworthy even of the previous reputation of the jurist who delivered it, unworthy of the American people and of the 19th century. It will be a blot upon our national character abroad and a long-remembered shame at home. Then it goes on. It ends this way. It says, it falsifies the most reliable history, abrogates the most solemn law, belies the dead, and stultifies the living in order to make what has heretofore been a local evil hereafter a national institution. And is it eloquent? I mean, can you, can you just believe, and it's not long at all, can you believe any, anything more powerful than that? 
uh, it was just it was just incredible. And and that somebody sat down and could write that so quickly, so movingly, so beautifully, and and with such strong such strong sentiment. But the the prayer of twenty millions was written by Horace Greeley. It was the middle of the uh, of the Civil War, and Lincoln hadn't freed the slaves. And Greeley was incensed about this, even though Greeley initially thought it'd be okay for the South to secede. Later, he changed his mind. He became a great advocate of the Civil War and of, and of Lincoln. And he wrote this a long, long editorial on August twentieth, eighteen sixty-two. It's addressed to the president. Very long. I just want to read a little piece of it. It says to Abraham Lincoln. President of the United States. Dear Sir, I do not intrude to tell you, for you must know already, that a great proportion of those who triumphed in your election, and of all who desire the unqualified suppression of the rebellion now desolating our country, are sorely disappointed and deeply pained by the policy you seem to be pursuing with regard to the slaves of rebels. I write only to set succinctly and unmistakably, unmistakably before you what we require what we think we have a right to expect, and of what we complain. Then he lays out with Roman numerals a brief on what they what they demand. But basically, it says it says free the slaves, and it ends by saying by lecturing the president. It ends by saying, "I entreat you to render a hearty and unequivocal obedience to the law of the land." Yours, Horace Greeley. Well, Lincoln sat down and wrote it and wrote him back. A beautiful, beautiful letter. I want to read it to you because it's such an important piece of history. August 25th, 1862. This was uh, five days after the editorial ran. The Honorable Horace Greeley. Dear Sir, I've just read yours of the 19th, addressed to myself through the New York Tribune. If there be in it any statements or assumptions of fact which I may know to be erroneous, I do not now and here controvert them. If there be in it any inferences which I may believe to be falsely drawn, I do not now and here argue against them. If there be perceptible in it an impatient and dictatorial tone, and there certainly was, I waive it in deference to an old friend whose heart I have always supposed to be right. As to the policy I seem to be pursuing, as you say, I have not meant to leave anyone in doubt. I would save the Union. I would save it the shortest way under the Constitution. The sooner the national authority can be restored, the nearer the Union will be to the Union as it was. If there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time save slavery, I do not agree with them. If there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time destroy slavery, I do not agree with them. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could do it by freeing some and, sleep and, and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps to save this Union. And what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help to save the Union. I shall do less whenever I shall believe what I am doing hurts the cause. And I shall do more whenever I shall believe doing more will help the cause. I shall try to correct errors when shown to be errors. And I shall adopt new views so fast as they shall appear to be true views. I have here stated my purpose according to my view of official duty. And I intend no modification of my oft expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. Yours, A. Lincoln. I mean, is that amazing? He sits down and writes this beautiful, beautiful response. A few months later, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Some historians say this editorial had nothing to do with it. Some say this editorial was very influential. And that that's why I say it's probably the most important editorial ever written in that it pushed Lincoln toward freeing the slaves. Now, I'll tell you a little footnote. Um, the New York Times and the New York Tribune hated each other. The, the New York Times was a young upstart newspaper, which Greeley had written was operated with, with uh, uh, more policy and less principle than any newspaper in America. Um, and so when Lincoln responded, the Times wrote a little, little editorial about it, about, the, about it, and it ended this way. The letter, like all Mr. Lincoln's literary attempts, 
exhibits the peculiarities of his mind and style, but the logical sequence and precision and the grammatical accuracy of this is greatly in advance of any previous effort. It is in infinitely better taste, too, than the rude epistle to which it is an answer. In other words, here's the President of the United States explaining this policy eloquently, and here's the New York Times bitching about his grammar. You know? But anyway, it was, it's, it's, a, it's a major, major, uh, a ma a major, major edit editorial in the, history of, in the history of America. Now, the most famous line uh, in an editorial is, of course, yes, Virginia, uh, yes, Virginia, there is a, there is a Santa Claus, uh, which uh, was an editorial bizarrely appearing in September. Um, this little girl wrote this letter in July. The, um, the editor, the editorial writer, a guy named Francis P. Church on the New York Sun, let it sit around on his desk. Clearly one day he was looking for something to write about it. He pulled it out and he dashed this off. He didn't think much of it. If you look at the, at the uh, at a microfilm of the page, it was buried in the middle of the page. Uh, you wouldn't even you'd be lucky to happen upon it. But it got currency. And it got current, and everyone was, they were kind of embarrassed about it. But it got more and more currency, and so uh, they started reprinting it every year, and everybody else did, you know, and it became the most famous line. If you listen to it, it's kind of a saccharine, crummy editorial, it, it, except for that, that one line. It, it starts out, it says, We take pleasure in answering at once and thus prominently the communication below, expressing at the same time our great gratification that his faith, faithful author is numbered among the friends of the sun. Dear editor, I am eight years old. Some of my little friends say there is no Santa Claus. Papa says, if you see it in the sun, it's so. Please tell me the truth. Is there a Santa Claus? Virginia O'Hanlon, 115 West 95th Street. Then he writes, Virginia, your little friends are wrong. They have been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age. They do not believe except they see. They think that nothing can be which is not comprehensible by their little minds. All minds, Virginia, whether they be men's or children's, are little. In this great universe of ours, man is a mere insect, an ant in his intellect, as compared with the boundless world about him, as measured by the intelligence, capable of grasping the whole of truth and knowledge. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist. And you know that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. Alas, how dreary would be the world if there were no Santa Claus. It would be as dreary as if there were no Virginias. And it goes on and on and on. It's like, it reads like a parody, you know. Uh, but uh, it's the most quoted line of any, uh, any newspaper editorial um, ever. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing that struck me as I reported and researched this book was the bravery of the editors in the South on the issue of race. Uh, it was just it was unbelievable some of the stuff uh, that they that they wrote and, and it was it was very brave and, and daring. Um, I want to read you one um, that a, a great editorial name a writer named Hodding Carter wrote um, in the Greenville Mississippi in the Greenville Mississippi paper which he owned. Uh, in uh, 1937 when Jesse Owens had won uh, his medal he came down and he visited a little town in in Mississippi and the Greenwood paper ran a story and a picture of him and it outraged the readers that the, he, the paper would run a picture of a black man uh, and so uh, he wrote an editorial defending it, it says uh, it explains why he printed the picture that he was a great man and everything and says and we'll print it again when we feel like doing it we fail to see anything traitorous to the white race in acknowledging the accomplishments of a Negro boy. We, then he goes on about they printed some news of, uh, of, uh, from, a, from a black town, too. It says, we admit the crime of printing in this newspaper stories about Negroes other than of their misdemeanors and brutalities, which irritate a lot of readers. And then he gets wound up. He says, get this straight, every one of you. We were brought up on a Louisiana farm. To our knowledge, every member of our family, as far back as any of you in Greenville can trace that mythical attribute called ancestry, have been of the South, have fought for it, and have loved its ideals and its foibles as well. 
but we personally have never felt so unsure of our status as a white man that we had to bully a Negro, to return courtesy with rudeness, or to make him think that he was a despicable beast who could sense neither kindness nor gratitude nor trust. You know, I mean, I mean that was that was courageous. That was courageous to write uh, to write something like that. I want to read you another one uh, about race. This was by William Allen White. Uh, and it's called a Negro Golf Club. I'll read that. This is a short editor. I'll read it to you all. And this was in 1922. Remember, 1922. It starts out, it says, a Negro Golf Club. At Westfield, New Jersey, a Negro Golf Club has been established and a nine-hole golf course laid out. A Negro colony there seems to warrant the golf course. The item that this course has laid out will cause a million giggles to sizzle across the country. Cartoonists will make funny pictures of it. Vaudeville artists will do sketches about it. Something exquisitely funny seems to excite the white race when it sees the colored race doing things which are ordinary parts of the day's work and play to the white people. It is though the elephant should drive an auto or a horse play the piano. The reason for this risibility of the white man at the black man's human activities is obvious, and it is no credit to the white man. He thinks it is funny to see the black man doing things that normal human beings do because the white man does not think of his dark-skinned fellow traveler on the planet as a human companion. The white man considers any colored man, black, brown, red, yellow, or maroon, as an animal. The anthropological conceit of the white man is ponderous, unbelievable, vastly amusing to the gods. Why should not the black man play golf if his economic status gives him leisure for golf? Why should he not have a motor car and a country house if he can afford it? Why giggle at the normal activities of men whose skin differs from our own? Something of the same psychological reason is behind the fact that we middle class people make merry over the fact that the worker in the mines and shops and furnaces wears a silk shirt, or rents a house with a bath, or rides to work in a car. Why shouldn't he? Is he an elephant doing stunts? Is he a horse playing the piano? What's the joke? if he develops the same desires and aspirations that we do. And who in God's name are we, anyway? Think of that. Just think of that. I've been up here for 45 minutes. Does anybody have any questions they would like to uh, ask about uh, anything? Yes, sir. Fire them. If you have somebody who's no good, you fire them. If you have somebody who's not telling the truth, you fire them. Well, I mean, it's something that you, it's a sense you develop over the years. And if you think it's wrong, you check it out. And if it's wrong, you fire them. It's as simple as that. Uh, like any other, like, like any other business, there are good people and bad people. Anybody else have anything? Yes. Why was I so passionate about it that I wanted to write editorials? Oh, you know that's an interesting question. I don't know. Uh, uh, part of the problem was we had this mayor down here and he just needed my guidance <laughs> he couldn't do it alone he just couldn't do it alone Mayor Tedesco and he just he had to have help uh, no because <clears throat> you know you ought to love the place you live just as the lo you love the person you live with and if you love the place you live then you you should feel passionate about that and you should want it to be a better place and you should want to tell about the wrongs and, 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 and about the rights and sing the praises. You know, the editorials that I wrote, I wrote the editorial probably every day for five years. And a lot of them were just about spring or, or things like that. And, uh, and then others were about uh, 
you know, uh, what a dumb thing Martin Jiski would do or something like that, uh, just to pick a name out of thin air. And, and, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, he thought the First Amendment was the one about guns. And, and, and uh, 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 I, was, I was really blessed in the five years I was writing editorials up here in that Terry Branstead was the governor of Iowa and Martin Jiske was the president of Iowa State University and I knew by the time I got to work one of them would have done something so outrageous that it would make my day easy. Uh, I, always, I always started the day, I always figured that, that uh, uh, a newspaper man uh, had, had to start, had, had to be outraged by the time he came to work and, and, and had, to be, had to be energized and so I always started my day by reading the editorials in the Wall Street Journal for outrage and then listening to Doug Brown's music, music shop on, uh, on WOI when he came on at 7.15. He always played a march and that would get me, get me going so by, by the time I got to, wor got to work I, I, was, I was pissed off but happy and, 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 and I, could, I, could, I could go at it. Uh, so, uh, uh, and, and the other thing is, if you're going to do it, do it passionately, you know. So, uh, like like anything else, uh, Barbara, you had a question. If uh, now that newspapers are available online, what they are <laughs> many of uh, golly. Um, if you were developing a an, an online. Um, table of contents for our young college students and our old college professors to read in the morning. He said, go read good editorials at these papers. What papers would you commend to their attention? And then go online? Yeah. The New York Tribune of the 1850s? <laughs> the uh, Emporia Gazette of the, from about 1900 to 1940? No. Well, I think you have to say the Wall Street Journal is. I mean, you know, I don't agree with anything anything they say, uh, uh, but they're they're effective spokesmen for their cause. They're usually well written, not as well written as they were when uh, when Royster was writing them. Uh, your your graduate Bob Bartley sort of added a added a certain edge to them that I didn't particularly like. Uh, Royster had more grace, uh, but Bartley was a great intellect and and. You know, carried the carried the water for the cause, uh, uh, but uh, uh, that I suppose. I mean, you know, there's I, I don't know. You know, I mean, I say today the editorials aren't very good, but there's 1,600 daily newspapers in the country, and I read five of them. And there may there might be there might be 1,595 great newspapers, and I just don't happen to see them. Uh, so so I don't know. You know, I mean, if I wanted to read good writing. I'd read Rick Riley in Sports Illustrated, or I'd read I'd read the essays of Lewis Thomas, or I'd read the essays of Vermont Royster, or I'd read or or I'd read uh, 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 go back and read Red Smith, Red Smith or Red Smith's essays, or or things like that. If I if I, if I were a young person in school and I, and I wanted to learn about writing, and then I'd take everything I read, I wrote, and I'd read it out loud. I'd read it out loud. You have to read your own stuff out loud to realize how crappy it is sometimes. You know how that you've that you've you're, you're clunky. Or you're junkie, and, and, and everybody develops a rhythm and a cadence and a beat, but you can't do it in your mind. You've got to hear yourself. You've got to, you've got to hear yourself doing it. Uh, so I would, when I owned the paper in Ames, and a young reporter would come and they turned, I read everything everybody wrote every day before it appeared in the paper. And sometimes I would say to a reporter, let's go next door in the building. You know, you didn't, we didn't have any offices where, but let's go next door and sit down and have a cup of coffee. And I said, read me this piece that you just wrote. And so they'd start reading it, and they'd get about the second graph, and they said, "Oh, this is kind of shitty, isn't it?" And I'd say, "Kind of." And, and <laughs> but, but, but you can hear it. You can hear it. You know, if you if you read if you read it if you read it out loud, and and so that's the main thing: report, 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 and then write, write, write. You know, nobody. You know, there's no first draft of anything that's great, except probably the Gettysburg Address. Um, uh, everything else, you know, you have to go over it and over it and over it, and, and it's and fine tune it and and hone it, uh, and so it's, it, it, there's not. I don't know what good. I don't know whether it's good editorial writing today. Certainly not in the papers I read. Except the Times sometimes has really good stuff, but I don't read that many papers. The worst are in USA Today. Uh, you know, it's 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 editorial positioned by consensus, uh, which is terrible, uh, and uh, they're they're not as they're not as 
uh, kind of tough and hard hitting and or or eloquent. Um, uh, let me read you. Let me read you something that reminds me of something else. Um, Actually, Jiski is what reminded me of this. Um, uh, he's not here, is he? He didn't come back for the night, did he? Uh, in uh, freedom, freedom is something that uh, you have to fight for constantly. And the best fighters for it are the newspapers. Uh, editors because they believe in it, publishers because it's a monetary thing. Uh, but in in, when, the, uh, when the Hollywood 10, when the McCarthy scale, when all of that was, was going on, maybe the best writer in America during that era was a man named E.B. White, wrote Charlotte's Web. Uh, one of the great books of all time, but but uh, but and he was a writer for the New Yorker, um, and the New York Herald Tribune, very good newspaper, sort of came out for loyalty oaths, which just appalled E. B. White. So he wrote a letter to the editor, uh, the, and they had written this editorial uh, on Thanksgiving Day. So he wrote a letter to the editor. It says to the New York Herald Tribune, I am a member of a party of one, and I live in an age of fear. Nothing lately has unsettled my party and raised my fears so much as your editorial on Thanksgiving Day suggesting that employees should be required to state their beliefs in order to hold their jobs. The idea is inconsistent with our constitutional theory and has been stubbornly opposed by watchful men since the early days of the Republic. It's hard for me to believe that the Herald Tribune is backing away from the fight and I can only assume that your editorial writer, in a hurry to get home for Thanksgiving, tripped over the First Amendment and thought it was the office cat. <laughs> and then he goes on to make his point. And they answer in an editorial just attacking him up one end and down the other uh, as, as kind of a menace to society for writing that. So then he wrote back a, a letter. It says, to the editor of the Herald Tribune, the editorial that you wrote about me illustrated what I meant about the loyalty check system and about what would happen if it got going in the industrial world. My letter, expressing a dissenting opinion, was a letter that any conscientious reader might write to his newspaper. And you answered it by saying that I belong to, quote, probably the most dangerous element in our society. Thus, a difference of opinion became suddenly a mark of infamy. A man who disagreed with a Tribune editorial used to be called plucky. Now he's called dangerous. By your own definition, I already belong among the unemployables. And then he wrote it, and, and finally they sort of, in a half measure, apologized, but really, did, but really didn't. And, and uh, uh, it shows, uh, you know, that freedom is freedom is precious. And all during the uh, the entire internment of the Japanese, there wasn't one newspaper that spoke up that I could find that spoke up about how awful it was. A lot of people said, "Isn't this nice?" And isn't this good for the Japanese uh, to be uh, doing it? And, and the war was, uh, the war, of course, was quite a, uh, you know, I mean, nothing brings out patriotism of, uh, of, uh, in editorials more than, more than war. And um, the Los Angeles Times, uh, I'll read you the first two paragraphs of a Los Angeles Times editorial. It says, Apology to Rattlesnakes. It says, Once or twice since Pearl Harbor, the Times has likened the Japanese to rattlesnakes. This is to apologize to the rattlesnakes. And then it goes on about how terrible the Japanese were, and they were bombing bombing us, and that was terrible and everything. But I don't think you'd see an editorial like this today. You've been standing patiently. I'm sorry. Forgetting my thoughts while I listen to you, however. Let me thank you for the words column. I'm sorry if it's not being written anymore. I wonder if you don't miss it. No, I don't miss it at all. I, I, I'll tell you why it's not being written anymore. I, I wrote it three times a week for 25 years, and I really loved it. And I woke up one morning a few years ago, and I said to my wife, I said, oh, geez, I've got to write a words column today. And it's the first time I ever said, I've got to write a words column today. I always liked it. And I thought the moment I said, I've got to do it, it's time to quit. And so I just didn't write anymore. Well, we enjoyed it. Well, thank you. Many of us here think of E.B. White as a part of the elements of style. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, write short. Be brief. No adjectives. No adverbs. Uh, I wonder if um, you would like to come in on... Uh, 
what you think are s sort of the major shortcoming of today's media. Uh, and I would suggest this. They think, yes, I know, you might think that their lack of editorials is, is part of it. Uh, I find a major failing is that they don't focus on the media itself. There's no criticism, there's no fact checking, there's no reaction. And of course the media today includes uh, some people that I think really um, don't tell the truth very much. I just wonder what you thought about the media's views on the media. Well, I think the media covers the media more than it's ever covered the media. And just witness the two recent difficulties at the New York Times, first the Jason Blair thing and then the Judith Miller thing, and it was all over everywhere. Magazine covers all over, all over the Times itself, causing great internal dismay and distress uh, and dispute. Uh, and discussed uh, about about all of that, and and so I think I think the media covers the media media very very well. I think that technology has changed so dramatically that what you see now is you see the media at work. Uh, you watch them work. You didn't used to be able to watch them work uh, before there were satellites and and before there was twenty four hour cable. It used to be a reporter would. Uh, would interview somebody, go back to the office and, and, and work it, and it would come out in the next morning's paper or that evening's, that evening's news. Now it's instantaneous. Now you, know, you see the airplane as it crashes. You see the coup as it happens. You see, uh, well, you didn't see Clinton, but you see almost everything and, and, and <laughs> as, as it happens. And, and, and so, so, it's, um, uh, uh, so, so you're just much more familiar with the workings of the media. The media is probably better than it's ever been certainly broader than it's, uh, than it's ever been. It's probably fairer than it's ever been. Uh, think about the names of newspapers, you know, uh, the Republican, the Democrat, uh, the Whig, the Independent. I mean, newspapers got their names by being partisans. They started out as partisan publications. My favorite one is down in Missouri, you know, it was called the, the uh, the unterrified Democrat of Osage County is now a Republican newspaper, uh, but it's my favorite newspaper, the unterrified Democrat. Uh, but so, so uh, they've gotten they've gotten almost bland in their uh, their attempts to be fair are almost unfair. Uh, I, be I believe so. Uh, uh, sure, there's rotten stuff, you know, and, and bad people, but by and large, I'm uh, uh, I think they're doing a pretty good job. Yes. Should a reporter have to reveal his or her sources? No. Where's that at? No, you don't think we should. No. We're not required no. to by law. No, no, no. I think that would just that would kill that would um, kill democracy. Democracy is built on two kind of two legs. One is an independent judiciary, and the other is the free press. And as long as you have those two, this country is going to be going to be great. And Supreme Court decision, the pendulum will swing and you'll get good presence and bad presence. But as long as you have those two constitutional guarantees, the independent judiciary and the free press, it's going to be a great nation and it's going to be a free nation. Well, the free press, the free press means you have to be able to protect people, to write what's going on and without fear or without favor. And sometimes that means protecting, protecting sources. Now there's a big difference between the confidential source, which is what I'm talking about, and the anonymous cheap shot. I don't believe in the anonymous cheap shot. I don't believe that I ought to be able to say that when there's a full moon, Don Forsling goes out naked and, and jumps over fireplugs. He happens to do that. I happen to know that. But, but, but um, uh, I don't believe I should be able to say that Barbara Mack told, told me that. I, I mean to say that a neighbor, a neighbor, says, a neighbor says that. You know? I, don't, I, don't, I, don't believe in, I don't believe in cheap shots, especially cheap anonymous, cheap anonymous shots. Uh, but certainly in protecting sources, I believe, I believe it abso absolutely. The Pentagon Papers. Absolutely. I mean think about the Pentagon Papers as a prime example. You know? uh, we never would have known any of that stuff uh, but, for, but for that. And the Supreme Court came right down, right on that. Just like the Supreme Court is usually right, you know, except in the, except in the case of, uh, of the Dred Scott decision and, and Chief Justice Cheney. I mean, Taney, but, but think of, uh, but 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 think of think of think of the great the great decisions like like Brown versus Board of Education and the things that have moved this country along. You know, it's been it's been the independent judiciary that's done it, and often it's the it's the free press that that uh, brings it up. It's time for me to quit. I can see. Uh, let me, uh, in, in, uh, I want to uh, tell you why I like 
why I like newspapers. Um, this is a quote from uh, William Allen White from his autobiography. He said, if I can find it, he talks about being a reporter and being an editorial writer. He says, news is a chameleon. What seems red today may look green tomorrow and turn blue next week. And it's the editorial writer's job to keep his eyes on the changeling and do the best he can with it. At the end, he can be proud if he was honest according to his lights, brave without being cruel, and as wise as a man may be who peeps at the world through a crack in the door. Thanks for asking me up here tonight. Thank you again, Michael Gardner. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that we do have cookies and punch over here, and thank you for coming. And we also have, we'll have a book signing, um, and maybe you'll get to ask a few more questions. So thank you, everyone, for coming tonight, and we'll hope to see you again soon. See you again soon. See you again soon. See you again soon.